Um, I'd like to begin our sermon in the Old Testament by reading a passage from the New Testament. So if you can grab your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, we have a couple of ushers that are walking around with some Bibles, and these are our gifts to you. So if you don't have a Bible, you don't own a Bible, uh, just slip your hand up and you can take this home with you free of charge. We want you to have the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to start reading in verse 12, and we'll read almost to the end of the chapter. The Apostle Paul once wrote, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it's not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. What a beautiful metaphor for the unity of God's church. Have you ever experienced this kind of a unity? The 1 Corinthians 12 kind of unity where all the members of the body are working as one accord, no member less or more important than the other, all working together for the glory of Christ. It is a beautiful thing when that happens. And it's a horrible thing when that goes wrong. We all desire this kind of unity, don't we? Do you desire this kind of unity for our church? I hope so. We want our houses to be this united. No one hopes for a broken house and divorce and strife. We want and we pray for unity in our households. We want our jobs to be this united. Ever work at a place where there is uh, discord and infighting and lack of unity? It, I mean, you, you just dread going to work every morning, don't you? We want our country to be this united. I'm not sure we've ever been so close to a second civil war as we are right now. It's sad, isn't it? I was reading the other day about the president, James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. How many of you were old enough to remember his presidency? (laughs) Anybody here? No? Nobody? He he served as president from 1817 to 1825. He was known for uniting the country together. He ignored the typical party lines that they had drawn in those days, and he served his country in such a way that during his his re-election campaign, he was so popular that he had only one elector vote against him. Only one. I mean, the last couple of American votes, it's been a nail biter even days after the election. He had only one no vote with the electors. Today, we're gonna see a beautiful picture of unity, that kind of unity. We're gonna see 1 Corinthians chapter 12 lived out in the Old Testament. So turn with me backwards in your Bibles now to Nehemiah chapter three. And as you're going there, let me just give you some context. Last week, we saw Nehemiah travel from Persia to Jerusalem in order to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. They were broken down. And after he inspects the walls during the night, he gathers the leaders together and he tells them of his plan to rebuild. And remember how the leaders reacted? They all gather together and they say, let us arise and build. Remember those words? Two words in the original Hebrew. Arise, build. Words of confidence, words of of encouragement. They commit to this work of God 
because they know that it has to be done. It's a holy work to be done. Well, today we're going to see what happens when a community of God's people gather together and work to accomplish something great for the Lord. We are going to see a clear picture of unity. And we're going to do this a little bit differently than the way I normally treat an Old Testament passage. You've heard me preach a couple times now, and you're starting to get used to my style, hopefully. Uh, I, I like to read a little bit at a time, explain it, apply it, read a little bit at a time, explain it, and apply it. And that way, the text itself kind of leads us forward. That way we can hear the plot unfold and we can, we can um, kind of follow the twists and turns of what happens in the narrative. But today's passage is unique. There is no chapter like this in all the rest of Scripture. So I'm going to treat it uniquely. What I want you to do is I want you to feel the effect of the full passage altogether. I think it's best felt like that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read all the way through Nehemiah chapter 3 all in one shot. And I want to warn you ahead of time. When we hit about verse 10, you're going to start to feel like this is a bit repetitious. Maybe God could have abbreviated it or something like that, right? And I'll say this before we even read one verse of it. Absolutely, God could have abbreviated it. He could have, right? I mean, God could have just cut to the chase, and in one verse, he could have said, all the people, men and women, young and old, noble and common, united together to build the wall, period, moving on to chapter 4. He could have done that, but he didn't. Instead, what God has done is he's given us 32 verses filled with names and positions, where they worked, what they did. He gave us repetition for a reason. God wants you to feel the impact of this passage. So let's read all of Nehemiah 3, and then we'll come back and think about what it means. Starting in verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Next to him, the men of Jericho built, and next to him, Zechur, the son of Imri, built. Now the sons of Hassaneah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshuzabel, made repairs. Next to him, Zadok, the son of Baena, also made repairs. Moreover, next to him, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of their masters. Joida, the son of Pasea, and Meshulam, the son of Basudea, repaired the old gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars. Next to them, Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Marathite, and the men of Gibeon, and Mizpah, also made repairs for the official seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to him, Uziel, the son of Harhiah, of the goldsmiths, made repairs. And next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs. And they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Next to them was Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the official of the half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. Next to them, Judea, the son of Harumph, made repairs opposite his house. And next to him, Hattush, the son of Hashabaneah, made repairs. Malkijah, the son of Harum, and Hashub, the son of Peath Moab, repaired another section and the Tower of Furnaces. Next to, them, next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of the half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs he and his daughters. Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. They built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars and a thousand cubits of the wall to the refuse gate. Malkijah, the son of Rechab, the official of the district of Beth Hakarim, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its bars. Shalom, son of Kol Hosea, the official of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He built it, covered it, hung its doors with its bolts and its bars, and the wall of the pool of Shelah at the king's garden as far as the steps that descend from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, official of the half district of Bethzer, made repairs as far as a point opposite the tombs of David and as far as the artificial pool and the house of the mighty men. After him, the Levites carried out repairs under Rehum, the son of Bani. Next to him, Hashabiah, the official of half the district of Kelah, carried out repairs for his district. After him, their brothers carried out repairs under Bavai, the son of Henadad, official of the other half of the district of Kelah. Next to him, Ezer, the son of Jeshua, the official of Mizpah, repaired another section in the front of the ascent of the armory at, at the angle. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section from the angle to the doorway of the house of the Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, 
The son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the doorway of Eliashib's house, even as far as the end of his house. After him, the priests, the men of the valley, carried out repairs. After them, Benjamin and Hashub carried out repairs in front of their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Maaseah, son of Ananiah, carried out repairs beside his house. After him, Benui, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah as far as the angle and as far as the corner. Palal, the son of Uzai, made repairs in front of the angle and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king, which is by the court of the guard. After him, Padiah, the son of Parash, made repairs. The temple servants living in Ophel made repairs as far as the front of the water gate toward the east and the projecting tower. After them, the Tekoites repaired another section in front of the great projecting tower and as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priest carried out repairs, each in front of his house. After them, Zadok, the son of Immer, carried out repairs in front of his house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, carried out repairs. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanun, the, son, the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. After him, Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, carried out repairs in front of his own quarters. After him, Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, carried out repairs as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants, in front of the inspection gate and as far as the upper room of the corner. Between the upper room in the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants carried out repairs. I don't know how many of you... Thank you. I appreciate it. Practiced real hard this week on that one. Um, I don't know how many of you have made any of those verses your life verses, right? But it's not like the most popular passage of scripture to read, study, and preach. God could have said, and they built the wall, and then moved on to chapter 4. But instead, he gives us 32 verses of unity on display. That's what this is all about. Imagine instead of those names, it was your names. That's the impact the first generation would have felt as they read this. Not only do you hear that unity in sheer vastness of this list, but you hear it in how the narrator even writes the list. Over and over again, you hear repetitious words like next to him, next to them. Over and over again, next to him, next to him, next to him. It gives you the sense of a group of people standing shoulder to shoulder to shoulder, one next to the other, all working together to accomplish a common goal. The phraseology somewhere in the middle of this chapter shifts and changes from next to him to after him. This is probably uh, the, the narrator's telling the story from the north part of the uh, city. If you take a look, we have a map that's going to go up on the screen here. They're probably standing at the north, at the sheep gate, the north part of the city. And as you turn down by the dung gate in the lower part of the city and come up north, the text transitions to after him, making its way up. So that difference in terminology is probably just due to the perspective of the narrator staring at the temple and telling us where each person was located along those walls. Now, you know the old saying, many hands make light work. This was a very diverse group of people who were committed to standing beside one another and working until the job was done. When you take this chapter as a whole, we see a lot of great things packed into it that should encourage us. In fact, as I was studying this passage, I noticed six key things that I think have direct impact even on today's church thousands of years after this was written. So let me point out to you a few highlights of this chapter, just six key observations I had in this chapter, and each of those are going to lead to some principles and application for our lives even today. And at the end of the sermon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these together, and I want to give us a glimpse of what this could look like right here at Riverstone Church. Sound like a plan? All right. Either way, you're here, so it's going to be happening. <laughs> so first thing I want you to notice the humility of the leaders motivated and united the followers. We see this in the very first verse. Read that again. Verse 1. Then Eliashib the high priest arose with his brothers, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. Notice that the narrator uses the same two verbs that we saw last week back in chapter 2, verse 18. Remember last week, Nehemiah gathers the leaders together and he says, we're going to rebuild this gate. We're going to rebuild these walls, rebuild the city. The hand of the Lord is upon me. The king has approved it. And he gets them all rallied together. And how do they respond? They say, let us arise and build. Remember, two Hebrew verbs, arise, 
build. Well, what do we have in verse 1? Then Eliashib the high priest arose with his brothers and built the sheep gate. Do you notice that? Let us arise and build. And the high priest with his brothers leads the charge in arising and building. It's significant that we start this passage with the high priest and his brothers. They're the first ones mentioned. Because of all the people on this list, out of every name that we just read here, they are the most important by far. They're the most noble. They're the most revered and honored. If anyone could have reasonably been given a pass to not do manual labor, it was the high priest and his brothers. But the fact that not only did they do it, but they lead the charge in doing it. They started it. They led the effort. That demonstrates true humility and biblical leadership. Maybe you've experienced this kind of leadership even outside the church at times. Think about that cross-country coach who laces up and runs alongside the team and runs alongside the team. I mean, that's a great model of humility and motivation. Think about the principal who lends a hand cleaning up after the fundraiser. That's going to encourage some people around them. Think about the construction foreman who spends some time behind the wheel of a machine in order to get the job done on time. These are examples of servant leadership. I remember when I was an undergraduate student at PBU, or Karen University now, once a year the university did this thing uh, they called the 11th hour breakfast. It took place towards the end of the semester, that, that special time of the semester when exams are looming, assignments are piling up, the students are wearing down, the professors are wearing down, we're all tired at the end of the semester. And they would do this 11th hour breakfast, 11 o'clock at night, and they would gather and invite all the students to the cafeteria. And I remember going for the first time, and I saw behind the counter, flipping pancakes, sizzling the bacon, uh, grilling the sausage, were not the student workers, but the professors. These men and women that we as students all like revered, right? PhDs and authors and deans of the schools flipping pancakes and serving us. What a great demonstration of servant leadership. That meant a lot. The highest example of this is not the professors at Cairn University. It's not Eliashib the high priest. It's Jesus Christ, the great high priest. What did Jesus do? Jesus, God took on flesh and dwelt among us. We sung about it before. Jesus is the ultimate example of what this humble servant leadership looks like. He set aside the privileges of heaven for a time, emptied himself, took upon the cross, and died for our sins. If you want to be a great leader, be a great servant first. That's what biblical leadership looks like. Our leaders should never be above stacking chairs after a service or cleaning up after an event or getting their hands dirty on a mission trip or a work day. Eliashib, the high priest, led the rebuilding efforts. Not only him, but his brothers as well. The other priests with him helped out. You can see a large number of other leaders on this list as you read down. You see multiple verses mention officials, officials of Jerusalem, officials of Mizpah, officials of Kelah. doesn't matter if you don't know where all these locations are. These are leaders getting their hands dirty. That's biblical leadership. That is Christ-like leadership. And that's what we should strive for in our church as well. Second observation I had here was that rebuilding the wall was a holy work. Going back again to verse 1, notice how twice the text says that the high priest consecrated something. They consecrated the sheep gate. They consecrated the wall of the tower. Now, consecrated is one of those words that we typically only use in church. They almost never use that word outside of walls like this, right? When my wife makes a dinner, we don't take a moment and consecrate it before the Lord. Only unless it's burnt, right? I mean, usually we just pray and we use normal everyday language to talk about what we do with that meal. And then we consume it. We don't use that word in normal everyday culture. The word consecrate, though, comes from the same root word as the word holy. What does it mean to make something holy? It means to set it apart for the Lord's use to set it apart away from everything that is normal and common in the culture and to devote it to God. 
You might look at this work and the enemies of God might look at this work. The outsiders will look at this work and they'll say, you're just building a wall. But what were they doing? They were doing a holy work. It's not just manual labor. It's for the Lord. Did you know that any work that we do for the Lord is a holy work? Jesus once said this to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42. He said, whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones, these little children, even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. Doing something as simple as giving a cup of cold water to a child is worthy of heavenly reward. It's holy work. Nothing you ever do, if you do it in the name of the Lord, is just a menial, meaningless task. When you stack chairs after church, that's a holy work unto the Lord. When you help cook or serve a meal for a church event, that is a holy work. You are serving the Lord. Later on in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, for I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. Prison, you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we feed you or thirsty, give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger, invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. When you put your hand to the Lord's work in the church, even simple things like donating food or clothes to productive lives, filling a baby bottle with spare change for Choice One Pregnancy Center, you are not just serving the Lord, or not just serving the people, you're serving the Lord. You're not just serving the poor or the the single mothers, you're serving Jesus himself. It is a holy work that you do. So the people of Israel, even though they're doing manual labor, they recognize this is a holy work and we're devoting it to you, God. It's set apart to please the Lord. Third thing I noticed here is that people of all social classes and genders significantly contributed to the Lord's work. Did you notice that when I read through that text? It wasn't just the religious leaders and the officials that were doing the work. It wasn't just the Levites and the priests. There were officials and there were servants working side by side. There were goldsmiths and merchants and perfumers, everyday blue collar kind of people. There were men, there were women. Look at verse 12 again. I'll remind you of this verse. It says, Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of the half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. He and his daughters. Women got involved in physical labor. Now, maybe that doesn't surprise you so much today, in today's world, but it was certainly surprising back then. That is a surprising verse right there. You know, one of the things Janice and I noticed and appreciated about this church when we first came back in July, we noticed that there were women on the platform. And I'm not just talking about the women who were singing, because you can go to many churches and see women who are singing on the platform. But one of our first Sundays, a few ladies got up and started talking about the women's ministry, RPM. And I thought, that's really good. Because most churches that you go to, there's like some dude that gets up and he's like, you know, come to the women's ministry. And you're like, why is there a dude saying this instead of a, a woman who's in the ministry, right? That's what we want. Then Janet got up and she talked about VBS and the impact it had on the kids and how great it was. I mean, it was awesome. There is no verse that I could find in the Bible that restricts a woman from making an announcement on a Sunday morning. There's no verse that I could find in the Bible that restricts a woman from publicly reading scripture like we had this morning. There's no verse in the Bible that tells a woman that they can't pray publicly in church. In fact, there are verses that say that in 1 Corinthians 14, that a woman does indeed do that. 1 Corinthians 11, I should say, where a woman does indeed pray publicly in church. There are some differences between the roles of men and women in both the church and the home. The Bible's very clear about that. I'm not saying there are no distinctions, but I think churches sometimes overread those distinctions and end up restricting women in a way that they probably shouldn't. So I was happy to see Riverstone properly allows women to actively participate in the public life of church. But what this text forces us to do is to understand that it doesn't matter what gender you are, it doesn't matter if you're coming from a, a high or low socioeconomic situation. Doesn't matter if you've got a college degree or not. Doesn't matter 
what it is, God has a role for you in his church. There is a holy work for you to do. Now, I should say that this text is not all hearts and roses. Uh, even in the midst of this great display of unity, there are people who threaten God's work. My fourth observation on this text was that internal opposition threatened the unity and the progress of the group. Look again at verse 5. This is the only verse that mentions this, but it's there. It says, moreover, next to him, verse 5, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not support the work of their masters. Apparently, the noblemen of the Tekoites didn't get the memo. They thought they were above doing this kind of thing. The, the Hebrew text here reads, they would not bring their necks to the service of their lords. There are only two other places in the Old Testament that uses that phrase, to bring your neck into service of something. Both times in Jeremiah 27. And in both of those other times, it's using this phrase to describe a people who refuse to submit themselves to those in authority over them. These so-called nobles were not willing to submit to their leadership. They knew what needed to be done. They were given direction. They were given vision. They saw the unity at work around them, and yet they still wouldn't do it. Now, unfortunately, you can find this sometimes to be a theme in many church ministries. There's always someone who thinks that it's their job to say no or to disagree. Doesn't matter how clear the direction is. Doesn't matter how biblical the direction is. There's always someone that seems to feel the need to not make it a unanimous vote. You can make a proposal as godly and biblical as possible. We want to share the gospel more and make more disciples. And there could be that one guy that's like, well, pastor, <laughs> I'm not so sure we should go in that direction. I don't know why he has a southern accent like that. I, it just came out in that way. I don't know what came over me. It's, it's an unfortunate reality, though, of just about anything you do in life. There will be opposition, especially when we're talking about the Lord's work. Especially so. There will be opposition from the outside, but more often there is opposition even from within. Maybe like a silent protest like these nobles did in verse 5. Remember the opening illustration of President Monroe's presidency, how unanimous it was? It was great. But less than 40 years after that, the Civil War started. Even the most genuine unity can disintegrate quickly when there's dissent among the people of God. Now, I'm not saying that you can't ever disagree with your leadership. I want to be very clear here. Uh, if you do so appropriately, there is a time for respectful disagreement. But it's clear here that this is indeed the Lord's work, and these nobles are rebelling against it. And the mention that they're nobles is a little bit ironic because they're nobles, and yet they have masters. They think that they're above this work, and yet their masters are doing the work. In fact, later on, the masters do the work again somewhere else on the, on the wall. I don't know if you've ever found yourself in opposition to leadership of the church, but I think it's helpful in moments like those to ask yourself, what am I pushing against? Is this worth the fight? What would happen if the leaders got their way? What is the cost of disunity here? What could be gained by submitting to the leadership? Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. It is to your advantage, church, that you follow the vision and direction of your leaders. It's for your benefit, because then we serve with joy. The church is all united and excited, and that gives us the ability to do our jobs with joy to give you more profit spiritually. Most of this passage is great, united, People of God doing God's work. But there's those one, that one little verse of people rebelling. But as you can see, even in the most united of times, there's always going to be a few who dissent. Now, the other thing I noticed here, this is the fifth observation, is that some jobs here are more glamorous and more convenient than other jobs. Did you notice that as we read through this list? On the one hand, you have people like Malchijah in verse 14. Malchijah was the son of Rechab, the official of the district of Beth Hakerim, and he repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and its walls. Malchijah was an official. He was a pretty important guy, you would imagine. 
And yet he had a stinky job, literally. He had to repair the poop gate. Remember we talked about the refuse gate, the dung gate, the poop gate last week. Don't let your kids hang out around the poop gate. Well, Malkijah was not only hanging out there, he was hanging doors there. That was his job. It was a stinky job, but someone had to do it. Supporting that first point that we saw, that the leaders led with humility and service, one of the things I noticed was that this stinky job was not thrown to a lowly slave. It was not given to the Israelite janitor. An official took the job of the poop gate. That's humility. Now compare that with what we see in the people in verse 23. Here's one example of several that we see. Verse 23, it says, After them, Benjamin and Hashub carried out repairs in front of their house. After them, Azariah, son of Maaseah, son of Ananiah, carried out repairs besides his house. So here are a couple of guys that are doing repairs right outside their own front door. They didn't need to travel far. It was not a long commute. They woke up in the morning, they walked outside, and they got to work. That is convenient, isn't it? I've been blessed uh, for most of my adult life to live very close to my work. At the churches I've worked at, I've, I've, in all the churches I've worked at, I've lived less than seven minutes from that, from that church. I like to live in the same community as where I'm ministering. It was a great commute. Uh, right now, I'm full-time at Cairn University, and I live seven minutes from Cairn University. It's great. It gives me just enough time to memorize one Bible verse before I get to school, and then boom, I'm there. Some of you know the inconvenience of a long commute. Well, in this Jerusalem wall project, some of these guys worked the poop gate. That was inconvenient, smelly. Take a shower when you get home before you eat dinner. Some of them worked right outside their own house. Piece of cake, very little commute at all. The narrator does not look down on either of them. The narrator is not saying one is better than the other. There's all kinds of work in God's kingdom. It's not always going to be convenient. I used to have youth workers, when we would go on mission trips, uh, we had youth workers that we would bring with us, and they would take a week or two off, sometimes without pay, from their jobs. That's not convenient. In fact, we had one family that would leave sometimes four kids behind at home, and then take a week off of their jobs to go with us on a mission trip. That's not convenient. That's not easy. At other times, it is quite easy when you do ministry. It doesn't feel like a sacrifice. It feels like it's fun. You almost feel guilty because you think you should be suffering for Jesus, not smiling for Jesus. But there are convenient times of ministry. When I was a youth pastor, I had to work VBS every summer. And I got to tell you, this is, this is from me. Worst week of my year. Every year. I, I don't like kids. I mean, I, right, they're good. Like, we need them, you know. I like my own kids, but you can keep yours. That's not my gifting, my passion. I don't know what to do with them when they're around me. Like, I, it's just, it's a terrible thing for me. It gives me anxiety. I could do this all day long. But kids, that's for other people with gifts and passions about that. For me, it was very difficult. That was inconvenient. But there were other nights where I would have close to 100 teenagers playing dodgeball, and I'd be setting up all day for it. I'd be breaking down till almost midnight. We'd be sharing the gospel with them. I'd be pegging them with dodgeballs all day long. I would do that any night of the week. For me, that wasn't work. That was a lot of fun. There are different seasons of ministries, different jobs in ministry, and I'm not trying to put down one ministry or the other. There are different gifts for those different jobs, and there are times that God will call you to do something outside of what you're comfortable doing. And there are times when God's going to call you to do something where it's right outside your own home and it's like, I could do this all day. And both of those are needed in God's kingdom. Now sixth, many who finished early helped elsewhere until the job was done. This is just good work ethic. You see a few names on this list twice. For example, if you look at chapter 3, verse 11, Malkijah, son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Pehath Moab, are both working on parts of the wall. Now you remember those two names. You look down at verse 31. And there's Malkijah again. Then you look up at verse 23, and there's Hashub again. They're both doing different parts of the wall after they finished their first parts of the wall. I used to take mission trips every year with teenagers. I love doing those trips. And I love those students and those adults who would ask me, Pastor, I just finished what I was doing. What can I do next? What else is there for me to do? I had this one girl. Her name was Maggie. Maggie was a workhorse. She would get mad 
at times when we didn't have enough work to do on a mission trip. Like when we ran out of cars to wash or, or things to do around the yard or whatever, like she hated downtime. She signed up to work all week and if it only took a few hours, well, why are you wasting my time, Pastor? I wish I had more Maggie's on every trip I've taken. Maggie, Malkija, Hashub, be that kind of person because God is glorified when his church is unified. God is glorified when his people are unified. When, when the leaders or the followers, whether, whether we're in either camp, when we strive to serve with humility, God is glorified. And that unites people. What we are doing is holy work. It doesn't matter if we are man or woman, if we've grown up in church or not, if we're rich or poor, God desires for you to make a significant contribution with your gifts and your time and your talent to the Lord. That's what brings unity in his church. Some jobs are glamorous and convenient, some jobs are stinky and inconvenient, but both are used of God. Don't be like the so-called nobles of verse 5 who stiffen their necks against the Lord's work. Instead, be like the people who, when they finished early, they went ahead and began repairing other sections of the wall until the job was done. Do you believe that we could be this united as a church? Do you want to be this united as a church? I hope so. Now, we don't have any walls to build right now. These walls seem like they're doing a pretty good job that, we're, that are holding up this building right now. But there is significant holy work to be done. Can I share with you just a few opportunities to do some holy work around here? And, and I want to say this. I'm not, I'm not sharing this to guilt you if you're not doing anything right now. My job is not to lay guilt upon you. People motivated by guilt rarely serve well. But my hope is that you will see what the Lord is doing already in this church and desire to be a part of it. That's my prayer. So let me just give you a brief walkthrough of how to sign up and serve in various ways in this ministry. And then I'm going to highlight just a few specific immediate needs of the church. We have a short video we're going to show here um, up on the screen. And this, if you go to our church website, you click on the serve with us button. And it's going to take you to this online form that you see. It's going to ask you for your name and your email. And then to check a couple of boxes and places that you're interested in serving. And that's it. A leader will contact you and talk to you more, get some more information. It's that simple. You could take a picture of the QR code on the screen right now, and that'll take you right to that, that place, and you could even fill it out as I'm talking if you want. Now, specifically, what is the Lord doing around here, and what needs do we have? Let me highlight just a few things. You might have noticed that after church, people stick around to stack and then roll chairs away. You notice that? Though just about everyone, and we really appreciate that, just about everyone takes a moment to stack some of those chairs. We also need people to help roll them away and to help stack them or put them out in the beginning before the service begins. We call this team, you ready for this? The chair team. <laughs> We're very creative with our names here at Riverstone. It's a great ministry. You can sign up for once a month or more. If you come early to, to set up, you can hear the praise team singing and practicing ahead of time. More of Benjamin, in other words, is what you get. It's, it's one of those ministries, by the way, if you're not a people person, this is a great ministry for you. Those chairs don't talk to you. Right? You don't have to talk to them. They don't talk to you. You can even sit in them if you need a break or whatever. It, it's one of our needs right now, though. Do you know why we, we clear these chairs every week? Kids, Wednesday nights, this room is packed with children who hear the gospel and are discipled for Jesus Christ. If you come on a Wednesday night and you just poke your head through the back doors there, you look through those windows, you will see this room buzzing with kids running around like crazy. Pastor Jeremy's one of them usually. He's like, you know, skidding around the whole room here. That's why we take these chairs away. Do you know why we put them back up? so that you can have somewhere to sit and sleep while I preach on a Sunday morning, right? <laughs> so you can be comfortable right here. We need people to help with that. We're also in need of some shuttle drivers. Praise the Lord, we are having trouble with parking again. That's great. That, it's a great problem to have, right? Praise God. The Lord has been overflowing our services and our parking lot where we need to shuttle some people from the elementary school all the way down here. We are looking for a few volunteers to do that. It's a very easy ministry. It's a fun way to get to know some new people. You have to be able to drive. That's kind of a requirement. But it's an immediate need for our ministry here. 
We could use a few more ushers and greeters. This might be a, a fun one to do as a family, get your kids involved. It's, it's very simple. You stand at the door, you smile, and you welcome people to church. It's a very simple ministry. You don't have to even be good looking to do it. You could just be friendly. We would encourage you, though, to get involved in some way. There are many, many more ministries that I could mention. I mean, I, I briefly mentioned children's ministry. They could always use gifted and loving people, especially when one of their pastors steps up and says how much he doesn't like kids. Like, they need help all the time, right? There's work to be done with our global missions team. You could do some simple things like contacting and connecting with our, our missionaries and, and helping with some of those contacts. There's a lot more I could say because the Lord is doing a good work here. He really is. I'm excited to be a part of it. And my prayer is that you will be as excited to be a part of it too as what we see here in Nehemiah chapter 3. I was reading through a book on Ezra and Nehemiah this week, and the author wrote this about this chapter. He said, They served with a unity of intention, a diversity of interest, and a variety of involvement. Unity of intention, diversity of interest, variety of involvement. God is glorified when his church is unified. As the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Let's take a moment and pray for God's work and our unity here at Riverstone Church. Lord, thank you for this exciting picture of unity that we see in Nehemiah 3. I pray that we can be like that. Lord, I pray that we can see what you are doing here, that we can get involved in this holy work, and that young or old, men or women, slave or free, rich or poor, whatever it might be, Lord, that you would help us to get involved and to love you by giving our gifts over to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see what those needs are, that if there's anybody here that perhaps is, is wondering, what can I do? that today would be the day that they find that place of ministry so that they can make a significant contribution to the work that you're doing in this community. Lord, I ask that you'd be glorified by it. I pray that Riverstone Church would not be made famous, but that you would be made famous throughout this world through Riverstone Church. And Lord, I pray that you would unite us together, that you'd keep us vigilant against those who might dissent. And Father, that you would humble us to serve even the menial tasks that need to be done. May you get the honor and glory for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for being here today. God bless.